<laughs> so our second session is titled On Endangered Languages, Digital Technologies, and Archives. Um, I'm just going to read the, the description of this session, um, and then I'm going to invite our, our first speaker up. So this is how we frame this, and of course the conversations are fluid. They're going to cross through all of the sessions, and that's what's really exciting about it. So we've asked, as documentary and archiving technologies rapidly change, we want to know uh, what role does the digital play in the preservation or conversely the loss of documentary media? What uses and reuses of language documentation are appropriate and who ultimately are the beneficiaries of these documentary initiatives? Has digital technology facilitated community access and control of language archives and served the ongoing project of endangered language revitalization? And how might this be either complicated or enlivened by the politics and practices of digital circulation and remix? So these are some big questions, and they're cut through by many more complicated issues, many of which were uh, articulated this morning. So I'm really looking forward to what our speakers have to say. Um, as before, we'll invite our uh, four speakers up to speak each for five minutes. They'll have a seat on the stage. And then we will uh, open up for conversation between the panelists and between the panelists and the audience. So I um, hope you have your questions ready. The first speaker that I'd like to invite is um, Dr. Candice Gala. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Language and Literacy Education here at UBC. So please welcome Candice Gala. Aloha mai kako o vau o Candice Kale Mama o Vihine Kapu Gala, no Hawaii Mayao, he polopeka kako o makikulenui o kolumepia pelikania. Aloha mai kako. It is my honor and privilege to be here, and thank you um, to Elder Larry Grant um, for hosting us here on the Musqueam Territory. I am a professor here in um, the Faculty of Education in the Department of Language and Literacy Education. Um, I am from Hawaii, and I've been here. But I've I've been here for about three years, actually going on my third year here, in um, First Nations languages and education. Prior to coming to UBC, I was a visiting professor at Kahakula Oke'eli Kolani College of Hawaiian Language, and I also was at Arizo uh, University of Arizona, uh, the program coordinator for the American Indian. Language Development Institute. So I bring a different perspective, um, not in archiving or documentation, but as a, as a specialty in language revitalization. So the question that I'd like to uh, discuss or talk about is, has di digital technology facilitated community access and control of language archives and served the ongoing project of endangered language revitalization? And how might this be either complicated or enlivened by the politics and practices of digital circulation and remix? So just a, a brief history. Um, Hawaiian, the Hawaiian community was one of the most um, literate communities in the world. Our language, of course, was not a written language, but the, with the arrival of missionaries in 1820s, um, our language became documented very extensively. We have a rich documentation in dictionaries, grammars, um, newspapers, over 100 different Hawaiian language newspapers that were published from the 1800s into the 1900s. But with the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom in the late 1800s and with the annexation of the Hawaiian Kingdom, Hawaiian language was banned from public and private schools. And naturally, um, Many, many Hawaiians uh, refused to use Hawaiian, of course, in those domains, but was, was still continuing this in the home. Um, if you fast forward to about the 1980s or so, there were a handful of educators that came together to design a program um, on Hawaiian immersion. And so th the estimate was about 1,000 speakers in the 80s. Now, if you fast forward to a current situation, there's about 10,000 speakers of Hawaiian language. There are over 20 different Hawaiian language programs, whether it's standalone schools or programs within the schools um, that offer Hawaiian language from pre-K through 12th grade. At Kakulo Ke'eli Kolani College of Hawaiian Language at the University of Hawaii at Hilo, you can now get your degree in Hawaiian language um, and 
you can go on to get your master's and your PhD in Hawaiian language as well. So these theses and dissertations are searchable um, and written in Hawaiian when you go to a defense that's also in Hawaiian as well. So all of these resources are freely available for download, regardless if you're from the Hawaiian community, um, if you're living in Hawaii or beyond. And so one of the positive things that I see with technology and um, being able to access these documents is wherever I live, I can always access the online dictionary, our grammars, all of these resources that have been available for us for the last hundred or so years. So here at, at um, the University of British Columbia, I often share with my students the wealth of resources as a model of what communities um, can partake in. But again, one of the, the downfalls of technology I see is, um, is, is in video. Um, I didn't mention, but I am also a hula dancer. Uh, my mom is a kumuhula hula master. So I taught a course uh, last year, last summer, on language revitalization and performance arts. And one of the things students um, would see is they, they can go online and go to YouTube, and you can find hula performances, and, and not unless you're informed about hula and Hawaiian language and culture, you wouldn't necessarily know if that's authentic or not. And so sometimes I go on YouTube and I find these great looking performances, but the motions don't necessarily match the story or the words or the language. And so this is one of the things I, I see as a downfall because not unless we really inquire of what we're looking at, will we really know if that's a true and authentic uh, language or culture. So one of the things I like to end with is that although I advocate technology and I support technology, we really need to keep in mind what our language goals are individually or for our community. And we really need to take into consideration various factors which include linguistic, cultural factors, social, economic, environmental, and technological, technological factors in order to determine what context in which technology should be used and or considered. So I leave you with this Olelo Noel which is a Hawaiian proverb, aohe pau ka ike kahala hookahi. And this translates into not all language or not all knowledge is learned from one school. So I'm here today to learn from all of you and we will take with us um, the information to help better our own language and culture. Mahalo. Thank you so much, Candice. Um, the next person I'm going to ask to come speak with us is David Nathan. David Nathan is director of the Endangered Languages Archive at the School of um, Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Can I thank uh, Larry Grant for the passionate welcome to Musqueam Territory. Um, greetings to the Gitsan elders and thanks to the other speakers and um, the organizers. I feel very, um, very honored to be here. Um, I wear a number of hats, including multimedia development for language support, but I'm here today in my uh, role at the Endangered Languages Archive at um, SOAS University of London. I've got a couple of screenshots flying by up there. Um, our archive has a couple of particular emphases. One is of um, recognizing and implementing and promoting, the same words being used here very much, protocol. That is in um, understanding that recordings Materials in endangered languages are often associated with sensitivities and therefore access restrictions and therefore access needs to be um, uh, mediated and uh, negotiated. In fact, to the point where we say now that we, we believe we have redefined or reimagined archiving as not so especially about preserve, preserving but about 
uh, providing a platform for the conduct of relationships between the information providers and the information users. Now, digital technologies are pretty cool, as we know, um, but I want to offer a few critical observations uh, about language documentation and archiving. Um, the first is, uh, and we heard just from Candice a similar uh, idea, that technology can skew or perhaps even reduce the impact of documentation. So there are a number, thinking of our tools and instruments uh, that we use, um, the software, for example, that's often used for annotation and translation, the software that's used for metadata creation, has a lot of built-in assumptions and certain capabilities which often take over the agenda uh, for uh, language documentation and, of course, downstream then for the potential of that for language revitalization. Um, I hear so often a whole lot of untested or perhaps even unscientific beliefs like um, in training, for example, documenters um, say that big, proper microphones like you see uh, John has used are intrusive and they uh, uh, somehow detriment to the recording event. Uh, not even realizing that the documenter themselves is probably pretty intrusive. This is a mistake that uh, probably anthropologists don't make. Um, and, of course, leads to a lot of audio not being as good as it could be. And I do think that because documenters have access to equipment and they have access, of course, to the speaker's time, then it's a respect thing that people have to make the best recordings they can. And, of course, I'm, I'm being a little cynical here, but in the face of a uh, fantastic um, example to the contrary. Um, there's the trap of the familiar. Uh, linguists seek refuge in symbols, and um, I have said that uh, they often treat audio as an inconvenience on the way to transcription. And um, this is a kind of colonization, if you like, that uh, makes them happy. What it means that audio is rarely uh, valorized um, or, or used. And that's, um, I'm sure some of you recognize that as a, as a shame. Um, so talking about audiences, uh, archives now and their audiences, uh, while I'm talking, here are, some, here are some of the text that flows backwards and forwards as people negotiate about materials in our archives. So I'll let you look at those while I talk on. Uh, I do want to mention that some of the influential archives and infrastructure projects claim to support various audiences, such as researchers and, and, and communities and so on. But there's, there's a very clear pattern. There's very little research, um, unfortunately, often little implementation um, and transparency about how actually they do support communities. Um, and indeed, often I think community participation is being sacrificed, um, or protocol as we might call it, is being sacrificed um, um, to the big data open access agenda. Um, so due to the efforts of many people, including Pat Shaw, um, here, uh, Leanne Hinton and many other people that you know of and I probably don't, what's happened in terms of ethical um, ethical issues is they've made their way into field work, but when, in this kind of situation, but when we get to the area of, um, of archiving, the agency of the speakers or whatever is often then um, lost or um, prevented. And that's, and that's an issue that I've been bending my head around for a long time to find solutions to. Um, finally, um, I'd just like to mention uh, at John's opening the other night, uh, he mentioned that in his uh, earlier project uh, with click languages in, um, in Botswana, that he'd, he'd been manipulating the audio, and that kind of troubled him. And I found that really refreshing to hear him say that, because as I was saying for linguists, um, the usual uh, modus operandi is to proceed directly to symbols and then um, uh, manipulate um, them fairly severely in the minds of, of many of us. And so I think it's important that we've got uh, new alliances, not only between uh, people like archives, documenters, the, the academy, and community members, but also artists who can uh, bring back some kind of um, um, uh, aesthetics and values to the work we do together. I finished.
Thank you, David. You can talk on this. Um, okay. Thank you. So uh, the next person that I'd like to call to the stage is uh, Mark Turin. Uh, Mark Turin is the program director at the Yale Himalaya Initiative. He's also director of the World Oral Literature Project and the Digital Himalaya Project. Uh, Mark will join UBC as chair of the First Nations Languages Program in um, July 2014. So welcome, Mark. I have a strong sense of deja vu standing up here, and some in the audience will know why. Thank you for this opportunity. I feel really humbled and honored to speak today, given my almost entire ignorance of this field. But it's been an incredible morning, and I'm truly grateful. Larry, also, um, thank you for reminding us of where we stand. I'm mindful of that and the unceded history of your people. I don't want to be iterative or repetitive because this is really a discussion. Um, and I'm mindful of a wedding that I attended last weekend where the husband-to-be said he was advised by his father-in-law, quite potent, when he stood up to speak, to be brief, be sincere, and be seated. <laughs> so I shall do the same. A lot of us have spoken about family here. And I'm going to invoke my father-in-law. Ben Schneiderman. He wrote a book a couple of years ago in which he said, old computing was preoccupied with what computers could do, getting faster, smaller, better, and cheaper. And new computing relates to what we can do with computers. And I think that's an important insight for all of us in the digital world. In short, um, the computers and the digital affordances that they usher in are not smart in and of themselves. They don't make things more creative, but they are very powerful. And if we can hitch our creativity to the gearing of digital technology, we have the potential to do interesting things. But there is a misconception that digital is safe. Digitization is not a one-stop shop, and many who have been involved in digital projects know it's far easier to lose your data when you're in the digital world. And it's also easy to generate data that you can't retrieve if you don't reactivate it, reanimate it, as it were, and transcode it. So there are assumptions that underlie the digital turn, and some of those are that somehow digital tools and digital technologies are more democratic they're not. They're not necessarily. They can replicate the very same extractive models of scholarship and research of which Pat Shaw spoke this morning, resource extraction. And they can do that on and with communities, just bringing colonization into the 21st century using new tools. Ironically, these kinds of actions can perpetuate the very structures of exploitation and personal advancement that the digital turn was set out to dismantle. So talking of sound and of image today, I think radio is something that we need to explore a little further. The power of radio is that it can be transmitted, of course, over the internet, and intellectual property issues of radio mean that um, radio broadcasts can be consumed and are all over the world, downloaded and streamed at the same time. But digital is still used as a word that somehow sits in opposition to real. When we talk about the real analytically rather than colloquially, we undermine the project of the digital. And we fetishize pre-digital culture as somehow a site of original retained authenticity. And I draw this insight from a very interesting book edited by Horst and Miller called Digital Anthropology. So in digital, and certainly in things that are digitized, in a way what we're doing is talking about new possibilities for the afterlives of objects that were created in different worlds. But reassembly, putting things into new communication and contact, requires assembly. Only through an acknowledgement of the analog moment of collection can the digital afterlife of historical objects have meaning. Understanding the complexity of what happens when linguistic, ethnographic materials are dispersed across collections across the world 
requires an appreciation of that moment of original recording. This appreciation doesn't mean we mitigate all the brutally extractive practices that came in the past, but simply that we think mindfully about the moment of collection as well as the digital outputs that come. But as David has shown and has spoken about for many years, archives are no longer places where objects or collections go to die. It's where things come alive, and increasingly linguists and anthropologists use archiving tools to actually animate their collections and coordinate their work and communicate not only their results but their relationships with people. When I first went to the School of Oriental and African Studies where David works, it, there were 15 doors between the outside world and the special collections of the archives. 15 doors. Now digital archives can have more or fewer doors. But when will the word digital become obsolete? When will we speak of digital photography as simply photography? When will we stop talking of the digital humanities and in fact just talk about humanities? I mean, who says, oh, I work in the analog humanities? <laughs> One of my colleagues at Yale, Laura Wexler, has convincingly argued that those who doubted and derided the importance of photography when it first emerged a long time ago now stand on the wrong side of history. She argues that painting did not die after photography, as had been predicted, but it was rather changed and rejuvenated through photography. The digital has similarly provided us with a platform to integrate and reassemble the analog. In short, the affordances of the digital are transformative, but only if we have more equitable social relations and knowledge communities to match. Otherwise, it'll just be the same old warm beer in newly improved digital bottles. Thank you. So now I'd like to welcome Clyde Talio to the stage. You've just gotten to know Clyde Talio through uh, the amazing film Cry Rock, and um, I'm sure come to admire him a little bit as well. But uh, Clyde, please come to the stage. Clyde um, is a New Hulk language teacher, as you know, and uh, you can see uh, how important he is in his community. So we're very privileged to have him with us today. Yes, <laughs> madam. Yes, madam. Larry, <laughs> Slachawa kick of ah, that's what at Manau at the absults. A few days ago at the at masts, the six psalms at Quidimut Dom's art, um, quantity tickets or chats. Why it comes here at or loop? Greetings, thank you for allowing me to be here to speak. Um, thank you, Larry. It's uh, really great to be ha back here on Musqueam territory. And uh, thank you to everyone that we're going to be sitting together and talking about this important topic. I'd just like to say it's a little difficult to speak right now. I had, uh, on the day I arrived here in Vancouver, our head woman of our house, uh, my auntie, um, had passed away, our last true fluent speaker of our family. So uh, my heart is really heavy right now, and uh, I'm wishing I could be home with my relatives while they're going through the process and for, uh, for her funeral. I, um, as, as it's been introduced, I've, I've worked at, this, at uh, our Aksauhta school for five years teaching language. Um, I'm currently not teaching language there. I'm exploring new ways in which we can uh, make our language a part of our lives. I find too much um, time is spent containing 
our languages in, in, in some form, either within a school or an institution or even by recording them, um, whether it be digital or, or in a book. I find that we're so busy trying to document that we're forgetting to, to live and to follow those teachings that we have within our, that our language allows us to experience. So before um, I guess I sit, again, I would just like to, to say, um, so I had said that uh, nothing that I'm, I'm going to say is truly my own uh, teaching. It's, it's been handed down from, from many generations and it, it comes from those wise elders that we've spent many times listening to back home and I hope that I can, uh, can pass their teachings on and share with, with you what I have learned from them. So thank you. Bye. Thanks very much to all of you. Um, I just wanted to start off by asking you a couple of questions uh, to get us started. And I wonder if you, know, you might have some questions to ask one another. Um, could we talk a little bit more about the, the tension that I think has been articulated very nicely between language, lived experience, exactly the dynamic that Clyde was just talking about? That's better, isn't it? And um, efforts to archive language. There's a tension between people living their language every day and experiencing it and um, working with the kinds of archives that are being produced. Um, and along those lines, you know, the way people experience language in an ethical way, in the way that they communicate with one another and share their knowledge in a, in, in a way that's appropriate in their communities. What does an ethical, and Larry's problematized that word very well for us today, so it's very difficult. Um, what, what does an archive look like that actually starts to respond to those kinds of uh, language elements that keep language living and, and circulating the way it should? Um, well, perhaps it's not an archive, uh, so one could problematize the term archive just like, you know, we have ethics. Uh, archive, although I have, you know, helped establish and, and, and still run an archive, it's not a very useful term anymore because nobody really knows what it means. I think it was actually Mark at a talk at SOAS um, said that archive means that's the place where you go to get the free version that talk. Um, we ourselves like to think of the archive as a, as a kind of platform for relationships and to think of what we're doing as more about publication. Hmm. So as to valorize the input from the various people and make sure the agencies and voices and so on are sort of represented. So we don't like to think of things as just data. Um, but uh, I'm also thinking of um, like in terms of not an archive, there's, there's a, um, a there are some proposals now in terms of how to maintain agent, ongoing agency of, of speakers, like you know, beyond being able to access materials and have a say in the generation of materials. Um, I think there's the Reciprocal Research Network here, which is a really interesting initiative. There's one which um, uh, one of my colleagues is, is working on, uh, uh, Ed Garrett, uh, some of you may know him, uh, project called That's Me, which is actually what, what they're thinking of there is some kind of website portal thing where participants in language documentation <coughs> excuse me, would be able to make their own representations of their own materials or claim them, say, that, that's me in that archive, you know, that, that guy in the background or someone's... Uh, or, uh, or that's my uncle, um, and make is what Ed called collect collections and corrections as well. Um, 
so that we start to move the epicenter from being the archives. And as I sort of hinted in, in my talk, I'm very concerned about from certain infrastructures trying to generate this sort of me megalopolis, which is great for the aggregators or the data miners or the resource, what was the word Pat used? Resource extraction people. Um, so we've got on the one side the sort of working towards resource extraction, which is inimicable to, so, sorry, in, is, is antithetical to uh, maintaining the agencies and relationships. And on the other side, we've got developments coming out of social networking and um, so on. So ho hopefully we can actually maintain diversity. Like we've all got this rhetoric for language diversity and, and, and so on, but the, the um, uh, a lot of the movements in the big infrastructure projects are actually for unification. Sorry to be so long with that. Thank you, David. I thought that was a very helpful, helpful um, contribution. Also, a great question, Kate. The, I simply think that the roles and relationships and platforms of what we're all engaged in are changing enormously fast. They're not necessarily changing for the better, but traditional models of scholarship just don't fly anymore. Elder Larry Grant talked about informants. The word itself gives me the chills. Right? I mean. My family ancestry is in Europe, where the word informant in World War II meant something quite different mm -hmm. to person who aids in a linguistic you know, field site. So I think issues of authorship and ownership also need to be clarified. I'm particularly interested in what's happening in academic publishing. And the very fact that archives are conflated or positioning themselves as a kind of publishing in a virtual space is also very interesting. Um, I think the traditional direction of what happened in scholarly production, which was data gathering, publishing, and then either just before you die or once you die, you give it to the archive or your descendants do, that's also changing, right? So you can, the directionality of research and the partners with whom we write and collaborate, this is all up for grabs. And that, I think, is a very important point. I, I would like to ask, if I may, of you, Candice, whether the kinds of things we're hearing um, here from Clyde about people being concerned about so much being recorded in, in your community, is that also an issue? Are there some members who say it doesn't all need to be so, so well collected? If we practice it, that may too suffice. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think it's really interesting to, to think about this because in Hawaii, as I mentioned, Hawaiian language has been documented for, for quite a long time. And so we have sort of a, a different history of peoples in um, across BC or across Canada and the US. And so a lot of, when, when you ask the question about archives, I don't feel like I necessarily have the expertise to talk about archiving or documentation, but, but something we do have in Hawaii is an electronic library, and uh, it's called Ulukau, and if you just look up ulukau.org, um, you can find our electronic library system, which is hosted through the University of Hawaii um, system in, at Manoa in Honolulu. And on this website, you have our um, Hawaiian language newspapers that have been scanned into um, and saved, and it's accessible, again, by anyone. We have our dictionaries, our grammars. A lot of our books that have been produced by missionaries or local Hawaiians and or others. And so, again, this is, this is online and available for anyone to use. Um, so this, this is a very sort of um, different perspective um, that maybe most of us are familiar with. Um, when I talk to colleagues back home, I always say, well, you know, I have students who come from First Nations communities or um, come from very small communities where they ask, well, do I have the authority to teach a language or um, do I have the right to record this type of information or who has the right to teach and or learn the language? And a lot of my colleagues say, well, you know, Hawaii is unique. We only have one indigenous language as opposed to, you know, the many across um, British Columbia. But we feel that 
If, if Hawaiians want to learn the language, our own language, that's great. If others want to learn the language, that's even better because now we're spreading our Hawaiian language around the world. And just a short, uh, a brief statistic, we have more Hawaiians living away from Hawaii than there are Hawaiians living in the state of Hawaii. And so a lot of our distance learning courses are not necessarily for Hawaiians who live in Hawaii, but it's for all of us who have moved away, whether it's to the mainland or to other countries. But we want to continue to learn our language and culture, and so this is our way digital technology has has sort of helped us and has helped continue helped me continue um, my my area of language revitalization while living away. When I was younger, I used to hear our our elders talk about where language came from. And when they would talk about our language and where it came from, they would often bring up a word. Um, one example of the word I will use right now is which is our word for rock. And I asked, why is it that we have a sound for rock or a word for rock like that? And um, if you know Bella Kula, and it's what you've seen from the, from the film, um, we, live in a, we live in a valley, river valleys that, uh, that meet the um, inlets and out to the ocean. And if you ever walk along a riverbank, it's rock, small rocks. And if you listen to the sound that uh, the rocks make beneath your feet, you can understand why our word is if you imagine walking. So, and many of our words also, uh, also have those meanings um, or, or re they reflect the land that they come from. So a big part of our language is being connected to our land to look around our land, to experience our land and to speak in the language and to experience those feelings and being able to express yourself in the language is uh, really important. I find that um, if we're too preoccupied with documenting the language, we put it in the wrong place. And uh, we begin to forget um, words because they're documented. I know that that's happened quite often. I'm working with a, um, a number of digitized reel-to-reels by an elder who passed away in uh, 18, or 1982 she um, spoke a very eloquent language. Um, listening to her, like as was mentioned um, earlier about the elder from, from Gitsan when he heard the, the older language, he made that comparison of sounding like Shakespeare. We too have that in, in Bella Kula. The language we speak today, um, I find myself, I sound like a, uh, like a, a child almost listening to, um, to this elder. But unfortunately, anyways, what I'm, I'm trying to keep my thoughts short, this um, reel to reel that, that, that she, the collection that she had had, we now digitize and we're working on, on translating them. I think the important part, if we are digitizing, we need to return that. Um, not, not so much the, the physical um, material to the family, but I think the teachings that are there um, she, sh she shares a lot of her family history, which today many of her descendants do not know. So I think um, a responsibility of, of us that are archiving or, or translating, digitizing, that we use our skills to help those uh, family members who, who need that essential um, knowledge that's within those recordings. It's not the, the recording itself that it's important, it's the teaching within the recording. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, yes. Um, so, I had a curiosity just kind of thinking about the ways in which uh, language, relations, and knowledge are embedded in context. And I guess I have a kind of prepared set of questions in terms of thinking about what kind of work is happening to make sure archives uh, respect the social relations that are within indigenous communities. Because some knowledge is proprietary. And how in archives do we build it in recognition of uh, not just the prior, proprietary to the nation necessarily, but 
maybe a family or a house group controls certain stories and has ownership over them, how can our archive really respect that? And how is that built into the ways our archive is done? And then the second question is, kind of really getting this knowledge back, there's, we sort of imagine the digital age just extends globally uh, and allows everyone to access it equally, but there are kind of inequities in terms of access to the internet. And how, when we try to democratize this, do we address that question of who can access it? Not every community has good access to the internet. And, and how does that come into these kinds of things? Can I try and answer those questions? I'll, I'll take the second one first because I, I have a kind of like a, a, a stock and short reply, which is in, I've been around in sort of digital indigenous languages support for a while, and uh, I don't buy the arguments about digital or online um, inequities that much because I've just seen how places that were unthinkable that they had access to online now do have, and indeed do have in ways that say, you know, older, less technological people in, you know, a sort of first world country like this don't, like young people in parts of Southeast Asia and Africa that have got mobile internet and so on. So I don't think we should make too many assumptions about that. Um, but about the first, I mean, in general, archives are not performing the function that you mentioned for a couple of reasons. One is that um, archives typically receive materials plus metadata and to some extent the sort of metadata agenda is pretty much dominated by formal criteria that might help like the resources extractors if you like. It is much more about discovery of um, data for analysis rather than social factors that you're talking about. Um, but anyway, in, in uh, I'm uh, I don't really want to sound like I'm advertising, but I think we were the first archive to apply social networking, social media type uh, principles to the question you raised, so that the idea is that it's not like the stalk model of archiving, which is sort of fly in, drop off the baby, and fly off never to contact again, but rather looking for ways for ongoing management. So our depositors and about half of them have chosen to have various kinds of access conditions. But one that we call subscriber, it basically means if you, you can find out about a resource in the archive, but you, you need to then contact the depositor or the depositor's delegate, who might well be a community member, and present your case and ask for permission. And then the uh, <coughs> the depositor or the delegate can then either give permission or write back. And I, I showed traces of some of that, that discourse during, during the talk. So we get a lot of very interesting things and sort of value adding happening where people are starting to exchange information, uh, invite each other to get involved with, with language activities and so on. So we think that's kind of the way of the future and the only way we're going to scale up managed access rather than being taken over by sort of big big data portal type uh, uh, methods. But having said that, uh, to be honest, it's still pretty much dominated by being mediated through the depositors who are typically the, the academics. And we, we do need to find more and better ways to maintain the agency of the, the participants. So I don't want to cut into our coffee break too much, but we could take one, one brief question. Yeah, I'm struck actually by how unnew a lot of this is in terms of archive. Because the kind of archive issues that we've talked about, for example, would apply to the Washington University Closed Archive, which is the standard repository for Northwest Coast material. All of these access issues and so on apply equally well to written material that was uh, you know, deposited by Boaz and his students uh, or, you know, in the 50s when it was recorded, proper recordings came along and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, the second part of my point is kind of um, there's an issue that comes up a lot in the Northwest Coast that has always existed, but is I think becoming more important now, which is um, uh, the issue of uh, archives being data dumps. 
where basically, yes, you have a beautiful recording with lovely microphone technology and so on, and it sits there as an artifact, and nobody is actually able to access it, not because of access restrictions or proprietary ownership or anything, because nobody can understand actually what's going on. And in the Northwest, we have uh, almost every language I can talk about, maybe probably from, you know, uh, uh, correct me, uh, with Luchal, but an enormous amount of recording material. And that recording material is often very well recorded, but untranscribed, unanalyzed, and therefore inaccessible, and not just inaccessible to linguists like me, but inaccessible to community members for pedagogical purposes in the future and for accessing their heritage. Do you have anything to say about that except, except let's get on with you know, transcribing and we actually need all our elders to be working as hard as possible right now on this issue rather than we collecting more and more recordings which then sits out. So, does it matter? I have a lot to say about that, but I don't want to hold the microphone so I better ask one of my colleagues if they want to say something. Well, maybe have an easy answer to that one, but, but I would like to maybe bounce it back to Clyde in a way, which is um, talking with you last night when I had the pleasure and also hearing you again today, I've started to imagine that this archive uh, would actually just be a temporary place for things to go and hang out for a while until someone like you comes along and re-enlivens them and oralizes them again. So just as we think about that whole move of textuality in scholarship, you know, that the oral goes to text and something quite a lot actually is lost in that, the standardization, the kind of elevation of one form to a standard, etc. But in your way of presenting it that I think is so compelling and maybe instructive for all of us, not to do him out of a job, because I think he's very good, but the archive is also just one step in an ongoing process and not the final destination for so much of the knowledge, language and culture that people need. I really think that when we, well, in, first of all, back home, a lot of the researchers, linguists that have come into Bella Coola to, to archive the language, they took their materials with them. And now they're housed in different institutions around British Columbia and even further. And uh, it's difficult for us to access them. And just as you said, they're not, it's our elders when they recorded things, just as we re record with our elders today, just as uh, linguists recorded with them before, um, we're not putting them on a recording f to stay there. They're only there so that we ensure that we don't lose it completely, so that we can catch up with our elders in learning that knowledge. We have so few speakers that um, right now we have to, to resort to recording. To, to digitizing everything because we have so flu, flu, how do you say it, few fluent speakers. Um, I actually am going to be here in Vancouver in a few months. I have to leave home in order to get access to, to a lot of those uh, really important materials and then work really hard to try and, and translate them and bring them back to the community so that they could uh, be used by families. Right now in our communities, there's so much uh, uh, culture being revitalized within the community. Um, there's so much uh, of our, our people wanting to live that life, wanting to live with the teachings, with the protocols, as what we saw this morning. People want that in their life. They need it in their life. Um, it's hard to, to live a, a as you heard in that documentary, one of the, the chiefs had said, um, you'll see people that be called the walking dead. And uh, I think for a lot of us, we don't want to end up that way. Um, we don't want to be, um, uh, uh, it's kind of funny because we don't want to be a part of a museum. We don't want to be a piece in the museum. And it's funny I say that because my picture is in here, but <laughs> I asked that it be at least hidden in a drawer so it, doesn't look like I'm <laughs> on display. But we want the language to be living. We want the history to be living. We, we want that opportunity to experience being ourselves, being human beings and contributing to the world um, at, from our point of view as Nukhaq people, as indigenous people from wherever we come from. I don't know if that, I kind of got sidetracked, but that, does that help? <laughs> Um, one more thing I want to I want to put to um, to that. 
Soon, um, we're going to be at a place where, where we won't have to talk like this. We won't have to sit in a room and, and discuss these things. I, I really believe that soon we're going to be um, speaking our languages. We're going to be um, living that way. And, and soon we'll be able to help share some of the, the maybe spiritual beliefs or the, um, the philosophies of our people and we'll be able to talk in a different way. Um, but for right now, I'm really glad that we are having this discussion here in this place and that there are people working very hard to, to try and to save some of, as human beings, our, our oldest our oldest histories as human beings here on this land that we all live in and call home today. Why? I'd like to add something to that as well. In Hawaii, we had um, a 16-year radio program called Kaleo Hawaii, which was produced by uh, Larry Kimura. Um, if some of you know Larry Kimura, he's a composer. He's a Hawaiian language uh, professor who's been teaching since uh, the early 70s. And so many of the professors that you see now teaching at the university systems um, has learned from Larry, who's part Hawaiian, uh, part Japanese. And so looking at his radio program, uh, there are some, um, some of his uh, radio uh, program material is transcribed into Hawaiian. Um, you also look at Brigham Young University, there's radio programs that have been, or interviews that have been done that are transcribed into Hawaiian and English. So because we have um, an extensive um, history with documentation and language teaching um, since the, let's just say, 60s to present time, um, we're able to use those materials in our language classrooms. And while I was there as a visiting professor, uh, Larry would take his students or or he would play his radio program and the students would transcribe them, again, because not all of them are transcribed, but they would transcribe them into Hawaiian um, and back into English. Um, but I think what Clyde said about living our indigenous languages, I hosted um, an institute and that was the name I called it, living our indigenous languages. When I was in Hawaii, I was away for such a long time um, for about 12 years at University of Arizona. When I returned back home, this college operates entirely in Hawaiian language. So while I was in Arizona, I wasn't able to necessarily speak to anyone in Hawaiian, um, although with technology, I could. Um, and my first meeting was three hours in Hawaiian language. I had my computer open, and luckily with Ulukau, with the online dictionary, I was able to type in every single word that I didn't know in order to keep up with what was going on for my first orientation in this college. But what is really great is that they created an environment in which Hawaiian language is used. So whether you're walking in the hallway, whether you're at the grocery store, you hear the language. And I think um, that's what Clyde is saying of, we're not gonna be in, hopefully in this situation where we have to explain what language revitalization is or what we're doing in order to preserve and perpetuate our languages. But we need to live it and whatever way we need to live it, whether we're documenting, archiving, performing it, speaking it, whatever resources we have now, we need to use it so that we don't need to talk about this in the future. Thank you, Candice. Um, I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists for this very engaging conversation. So we'd uh, like to invite you all to take a little coffee break now. It's not a long one. Um, on the schedule, we are hoping to uh, all assemble in the Great Hall, so at the bottom of the ramp, for Peter Morin's performance by 2.30. That's only.